My name is Graham Bethune. I'm a commander, retired pilot from the Navy, and I went through the regular Navy program of training pilots. I graduated in 1943 from Pensacola, the Academy of the Air. And uh, uh, of course, all Navy pilots are trained navigators, which is very important when you're going to talk about what we're talking about, because we, we had to know all this, the star systems and we had to know these type of things. I navigated maybe 13 years around the planet with the stars. And uh, I, uh, when I first graduated from Pensacola in 1943, uh, I went to the South Atlantic and we were hunting German submarines. This was all night flying. Everything we did was at night at that time, being in patrol planes. Uh, when I was transferred to Air Transport Squadron 1 in 1950, here again, we were flying, most of the uh, Earth's surface is water, and you're flying over the ocean, so you're navigating with the stars. And I was sent to um, Keflavik, Iceland, along with two other officers, after a meeting that they'd had in Washington, D.C., where Iceland was involved in, in seeing things over Keflavik, Iceland, and they wanted troops up there to protect them. During our meeting, um, they were explaining to us why they had requested the troops and what they were seeing, and we asked them if it could really go into more detail about the type of craft that they were seeing. In their explanation, they were seeing most of them at night, lighted craft, circular, and, and we knew coming from the Naval Air Test Center, we tested everything there, that we had nothing like that that we tested. So. I asked them, I said, what did our government tell you they were? And they said, your government said they were experimental, probably experimental Russian bombers. The flight that we had our encounter on was from Keflavik, Iceland, to Argentia, Newfoundland. And as we took off at the, on the 9th of February, and of course we flew through midnight, which it meant it about 30 minutes after midnight, this is the position we're in here, and that's where the encounter took place. The flight was normally about 10 hours, but that night we had a 60 knot wind. And um, it was a headwind. And about uh, maybe 300 to 400 miles outside of uh, Keflavik, I mean out of, out of Argentia, I'm sorry, I saw something below the horizon on the water that looked like approaching a city at night. It was just kind of an ambient light, no definition whatsoever but the same thing that you would see if you were approaching a large city at night. So I watched it for a while. It was about uh, one o'clock. And then finally I called uh, Kingdon's attention who was sitting in the, in the right seat, who was, who was route checking me. And he took a look at it and he didn't know what it was. We couldn't figure out, there was nothing out there. We had passed over the guard ship back in those days. They had a guard ship uh, uh, that was between Iceland and between uh, Newfoundland. The uh, guard ship had given us the latest weather. The weather was clear. There was no northern light activity, which they give as part of the weather report. And we had, uh, we had ship plots. There were no ships plotted in that area. So we asked Coger if he could give us another fix and find out if we were really on course. We thought maybe we had drifted. We were, going, we were seeing Labrador, the coast of Labrador, or maybe the tip of Greenland. So he said, no, we were right on course. So we watched it for a while. And we were drifting to the right of it, and where our heading was 222 degrees, 225 degrees in that, that direction. Um, as we became, I would say, we were at 10,000 feet, I would say it was 40 miles away originally, in the, in the vicinity, 40 miles away. When we were about uh, 25 or 30 miles away, we could see defined lights, and it was a pattern on the water. So with that pattern, we couldn't figure out what was going on. Maybe the Navy was doing something uh, that was highly classified, recovering something out in the ocean or something of this nature. So that was our thoughts. And, and uh, it was a circular pattern, and it was very large. I mean, just, uh, it's, I, I couldn't estimate the size of it. So I sent the, uh, the crew chief back to get the plane, other plane commander, Al Jones, because they wanted to land at Argentia. So when the crew was coming up from back half, there were 31 passengers, and, and, and we had two VP crews, which had pilots also, and patrol plane pilots. And uh, at the time that they came forward, 
the lights went out on the water. There was nothing on the water. This is about 15 miles away. I mean, it was just dark. Now, standing behind me was the navigator, the radioman, and also the plane captain, plus them. The cockpit was full, and there were heads all over the place. And, and all of a sudden, we saw on the water a yellow halo that was very, very small, about 15 miles away. And it came up to 10,000 feet like that, that a fraction of a second. And I thought it was going to go right through us. And I disengaged the autopilot, push your nose over, because I was going to go under it at the angle it was coming toward me. So what happened, the minute that I did that, it was up at our altitude, and I could see nothing outside of the cockpit but this craft. And, and, uh, and uh, so I didn't know which way to go. And then all of a sudden, I heard a racket. I didn't know what it was. And I said, Fred, what the hell was that? He's, he looked around and he says, oh, he said everyone was ducking in the back of us and they collided and they're all laying on the deck, <laughs> deck back there scrambling on the deck. So when I looked back, it wasn't there. And he says, it's over here on the right-hand side. Now, it was about a, a mile or so away on the right-hand side and it kind of drifted forward maybe to a position maybe five miles away and that's where it stayed with us for quite some time. This is when we could first see it wasn't above our our altitude, it was below our altitude, but it was still above the horizon where you could see the side of the craft, you could see the dome, and you could see the color around the, the, the perimeter of the craft. And l then we knew that it was a friendly encounter. We knew it knew we were there. We knew it came out to see us, and, but we didn't think at that time that the reason it did, it did this is because they wanted to show us what the Icelanders were talking about. So we, we watched it for a while, and, and Al says, well, let, me, let him get in the seat. So I let him get in the seat, and, and, uh, and uh, he disengaged the other pot and was going to chase it. Well, now, we, we had a ground speed, of, his head went about 60 knots, so our ground speed was maybe only 120, 130 knots. And so he wasn't going to go too far in chasing this thing, but he did turn to chase it. So I decided I would go back after to see how the passengers reacted and also talk to the doctor that was back there, he used to make the trip over there. He had a daughter going to school in London. And, and uh, so I went to him first. I said, Doc, did you uh, see what we saw? And he says, yeah. He says, he looked me straight in the eye. He says, yeah. He says, it was a flying saucer. He says, I didn't look at it because I don't believe in such things. Well, it took me a couple of seconds to recognize it. He couldn't believe being a psychiatrist in, in that. So I went back uh, forward and I said, Dal, whatever you do, don't tell anybody we saw anything. He'll lock us up as soon as we get on the ground. He said, it's too late. He said, I just called Gannon to control to see if they could track this by radar. So that's how the, 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 it got out. So when we landed at um, Argentia, the Air Force was there and they interrogated us. And the captain that did the interrogation did a real good job, but you could tell that this wasn't his first time that he'd ever interrogated anybody as far as the scrap of thing. The water was yellow around. Now, since then I've learned, not long after that, I learned from, we'll say, the boys upstairs, why we saw different colors as it, as it was coming toward us. The colors were around the perimeter. It was kind of at an angle to where you could not uh, see the back ring of the, of the craft. It was around the, the perimeter of the craft. And it, 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 turned from a yellow to an orange to almost a fiery red and then an almost a purple red. And they said that that had to do with the amount of energy used, being used or dissipated. It had to do with, with the power, so to speak. And so when it slowed down close to us in a fraction of a second, it was back to the yellow range. And it was foggy all around it to where you like a, a plasma or a mist or something of, of this nature. Now, as far as any lights, there were no lights that we saw. This was just around the perimeter. When it was out uh, where most of the crew members or the people in the back of the airplane saw it, it was fire in color. Every, every report, every one of them stated that in the, in the uh, report that we got out of the archives. Everyone said fire in color, ring fire in color. We had like a knowing. When that question was asked, it was 300 feet that came in my mind. And when I got the report out of the archives in 1991, I'd never seen anybody else's report. Everyone had been anywhere from 250 to 350 feet in diameter. And when I talked to others, they said, well, just something that they knew and, and, and estimated. Now, the velocity when it left us was estimated from between, eight, uh, between 1,000 miles an hour to 2,000 miles an hour. And when I looked at the, at the report, uh, Al Jones had uh, estimated 1,800 miles an hour. Mine was a thousand another one was 1500 miles an hour in that range 
It turns out that the radar report, which I've never seen, said it was 1,800 miles an hour. So the other plane commander was sitting in the seat, uh, took my seat, he, he hit it right on the nose. And of course, I was at the Naval Air Test Center. This is where we trained the astronauts, and this is where we had our test pilot training school. This is where we did all the highly classified uh, tests of aircraft, and to my knowledge, we had nothing but anywhere near approach to speed or anything that was circular. They were flying at 10,000 feet, and I, this is drawn like that you're in another aircraft flying 90 degrees to this aircraft in this direction, but you're at 5,000 feet, so we would be in this height here. We would count counted seconds to be at 1,001 would be the second one. Well, it wasn't quite a second, a second, or maybe two at the very most. Now, that was 15 miles that it covered in that short period of time. Now, you could calculate how fast it came toward us, and just like you just put the brakes on it, in front of us, but you take something three feet in diameter, 300 feet in diameter, and, and look out, you don't see much out of, out of your cockpit window. Then this is the light pattern that we saw. Then in this position here, there was no light. Then this is a little yellow halo, and this is the way it came up to us. In fact, I've been corresponding with a magnetic engineer for several years, he's writing a book. He's already got pretty close to 100 pilot reports, and I gave him in detail uh, everything that happened. Uh, I went to set the automatic pilot back and the, the, the magnetic compass, which is in the center of the panel, was swinging back and forth. I said to Fred, I said, did you see that? He said, you should have seen it when the craft was close. He said it was spinning. And so then we looked at the others. Now, you, at that time, the craft was sitting out maybe five miles from us. We had what we call bird dogs. They're low frequency uh, radio uh, pointers that will point to the station when you, t you tune in the station. These two bird dogs were pointing towards the craft just like this. We had another, we had two other compasses. We had an, uh, a remote compass which is out in a wing which doesn't anything affect it, but it was reacting. Now, what I set the, the, the instruments back on was that we had a vacuum operated uh, directional gyro, and in the autopilot we had a, a, a hydraulically operated uh, uh, gyro, so none of these were affected. So I was able to sit there, set our course back using those. But those were the things that we noticed, that there was a total of five different directional gyros in that airplane. And out of the five, uh, three of them were acting up. But it was tracked by radar. That same trip, flying the troops up, I said, Fred, did you know that it was tracked by? Oh, he said, yeah, I knew that two weeks after it happened. I said, well, why didn't you tell me? I said, the report go in? He said, as far as he knows, he said, the one that he talked to said it was sent in to the Air Force headquarters in Washington, D.C. Uh, it usually goes from there to Wright-Patterson is where it was sent. So, But when we got, now my boss, that's another thing. When he found the report in the archives uh, in uh, Wright-Patterson on Project Blue Book and talking to uh, Com uh, Colonel Watson, uh, he, when he came back to me, uh, he, he gave me the speed of 1800 miles. I said, where did you find that out? And he said, well, it was a radar report that said that. So something happened to the radar report before the microphone, because what I have on microphone, I got from the archives. I was told by a friend of mine there that I'd known for years that they had allowed Steven Spielberg to microfilm this, the Blue Book records for whatever, Close Encounter of the Third Continent or something of this nature. So he had a pretty high clearance. He had to be himself associated with some of the, well, you know who, <laughs> as far as the majority agency is concerned. The other plane commander I located Oh, many years ago when he was uh, with this company that he wouldn't talk. After he retired, I got a hold of him again in 1996, and I flew out to where he lived. I said, what we'll do is we'll just take a tape recorder and we'll both discuss it. And I says, and later on I'll have somebody else interview so they don't have to believe it. So that's what happened. <coughs> his re he, in, in the report that I wrote, his statement is in there, several pages of his statement. His, uh, his schematic of, of what he saw is in there. And it was amazing how, how they matched. This is what they saw. They saw it under the wing, see, right here. So we figured it was in this position here at the time that they saw it. The, the document that I found was the official document that uh, the Air Force had put together, different sources that came to them. And it was originally filed, it was under Project Grudge. You can see in their written Project Grudge, but on the, the front page, it says Project Twinkle. Now this is where they put a lot of ones that they had to 
get rid of somehow. It was Project Twinkle. So it, it was in Project Blue Book and Project Grudge and what other project I don't know that it was in. It was 18 pages according to the archives, but they only found 17 on a film. So it could have been a radar report, it could have been anything. And I was flying at that time Admiral McCormick, who had relieved Eisenhower. Admiral McCormick was the NATO commander, the Supreme Allied commander. Now his aides had approached me. Everybody seemed to know about it because it wasn't that highly classified. Like uh, Admiral Raffer, who became the first Joint Chiefs of Staff, his aides knew about it because they had talked to me about it. So there's quite a few that knew, knew about this. So this is where I learned a lot that really was not uh, official, but it, and it was really not in any books. This, of course, is the flight over Washington, D.C., if you remember, 1952, July the 20th. And, of course, this was after our encounter. And what this did, it helped us prove our sanity to our friends. <laughs> because if they didn't believe what we saw, all they had to do was observe visit. When I, we came back after taking the troops up, when we came back, this was in, in, uh, in uh, May, I had an intelligence officer come through the house. And, uh, and they, uh, he was, uh, he didn't seem like that he was that much interested in the reports that he was working on there with me. And he showed me pictures, the first pictures I'd ever seen of me. There was nothing, absolutely nothing there that even looked close to it. It was one, it was, he claimed was 100 feet in diameter, pretty close to 100 feet in diameter. Didn't look like it was damaged too much. And, and so I, I, he's the one I asked a lot of questions. I says, what happens to this, this report? He told me exactly what happened. He says, there is a committee. Now, this is his words. There is a, a, um, gosh, a joint intelligence committee. Of course, you have to realize the Air Force was formed in 47. It was only natural. We got, each one had an had a, had a, a, a intelligence committee committee and so they had a joint intelligence committee and he said and they make the decision as to where it goes to because they were coming to me a lot of times and showing me photographs a lot of them look like what we would call Foo Fighters a lot of them look like just a a round bright disc of some kind now I've got uh, uh, there was a uh, Secretary of Navy uh, Kimball uh, I was a, what you call a VIP plane commander in the flag division which flew most of the high-ranking officers and civilians out of Washington, D.C. And, um, and we had uh, uh, several of those. Now, they, they told me what they saw. There were two craft flying together out in the Pacific, and it was just a, a bright disk that came up beside one of them and stayed with them for a while and flew around it, and they couldn't estimate the size of it at 50 to 100 feet in diameter. Our office came under the headquarters at, at wright Patterson. Uh, were, uh, it was a central district. That means all of the Bureau of Aeronautics reps in the central district. That would be the test pilots. Uh, any of the officers in these uh, plants that were test pilots or accepting airplanes and this type of thing. So you had, two, you had engineering meetings, you had pilot meetings, you had all these, all these type of meetings. And I would go down there about once or twice a month in the meetings. Plus I would go maybe two or three times a year for seminars. We'd have it be a week or so. On the flight line where we parked our plane most of the time, uh, it, we weren't too far from, uh, it looked like a hangar, it looked like a corrugated metal hangar, and it was open most of the time. Every time my boss and I'd go by there, he couldn't understand why I was not interested in going and looking at what was behind the metal uh, wall back there. And he told me basically that they had a craft back there, and he told me basically that they did have bodies there. Now, he's not the first one that ever told me that. After he found our report in Project Blue Book down there, then he became interested himself because the discussions he had had, the discussions he'd had with Admiral Forney, because Admiral Forney was our missile chief and he'd spent time at White Sands, that Admiral Forney was convinced that the craft from other planets were visiting us. And after this is when he became aware and he did the, 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 the officer that he was talking to was Colonel Watson, because he kept bringing up Colonel Watson's name. So he was allowed, he, Colonel Watson let him look at a lot of these files, plus he was the one that told him about what they had there. He saw what they had there, and as I said, he, he couldn't understand why I was not. I said, well, really, I don't have any interest. I said, I'll never be able to talk about it. And I know enough now from what I've seen uh, that, that I know they exist, and that, and, but I uh, really had no interest in seeing it. And, it, and many, he, two or three times he'd ask me the same thing. 
Yeah. You haven't yet said what, what, what it was that you didn't look at. And you haven't it was a craft. It was a craft that did crash somewhere. Extraterrestrial? Extraterrestrial crafts, exactly. The, a lot of them had, uh, I had a top secret clearance, uh, but uh, here we get back to the need to know, and, and I, I'm sure that in a lot of cases that uh, the other people had the need to know about certain things that I didn't have, and you have to realize this is where the Army and uh, I guess eventually Air Force too, but the Army and Navy had their aeronautical engineers there, basically. They had a lot of training that they went through there. And, and so I'm sure if it, we had anything from another planet, that some of these engineers would be involved, whether it were magnetic engineers or aeronautical engineers or whatever they were, they'd be involved in looking. And, and of course, I'm sure a lot of them would, uh, would be civilian too. Just so many things that I can, being in the military, what do you think the generals and admirals would, would, would think when they hear there's something out there, a couple of these little craft could destroy all of their forces? And one thing, naturally, that their jobs too. Well, I, I'm sure that, as we all know, that Muroc, which is uh, Edwards Air Force Base, I'm sure, I'm sure that there are a lot of places that have underground facilities. I can state one uh, in your Kern. In your Kern, I think that's China Lake or close to it. That was the name of the airport. I delivered an, a transport there at one time, and and of course they wouldn't let me go anywhere. The duty officer would go to lunch with me and what have you. And he told me some things about, uh, some things he says, once you come here, you don't leave. And I knew that they had, uh, what he indicated, he didn't tell me outright what was there, but there's no question in my mind, it was a lot of the top safe work done there and a lot of things that we don't know about. Uh, I do know that we did bring some of the craft back from Germany after World War II because in a plant that we had there in Detroit, we gave the Army some space for the Redstone Jupiter missile, and they had some V-2 rockets there that they, we brought back. And, and talking to a lot of these engineers, Werner von Braun, his brother, uh, I'm sure that, that, uh, that some of the technology that they brought back from Germany, that, that, and it could, it's probably been done all over the place. In fact, Corso's book, I was involved in some things that I'm suspicious that were of the same nature where they were asking us to see if we could find a contractor in the area that could build something like this or back engine or something like it. And we never thought about it when they said, well, it wasn't our technology. We said, well, so what? You know, the Germans had a much higher technology than we did. My son was about eight years old and uh, we were sodding the backyard. And um, uh, I went into the house to wash up and he came into the house and says, Dad, Mommy wants you outside. I says, what for? He says, we're looking at flying saucers. Well, I thought to myself, what the heck does he know about flying saucers? So I go outside, and here she is standing and pointing to something up above us. And you know what it was? It was a small mothership about the size of the Adamski ship, and there was small craft all around. So I go back in the house and get the binoculars because I want to get a good look at this. So I come back, and and the ship itself had gone, but I got a chance to see two or three of the small ones. And they were identical with the little three balls underneath condensers, what have you, to the Georgia Dempsey crowd. So, you know, when we got back in the house, I asked my wife, I said, well, how did you find out about flying saucers? Because we were not supposed to tell her, even our wives in our encounter, which was in 51. She said, um, I, uh, now she was explaining to him how they launch them and retrieve them and the bottom and the top, she was explaining this process. And she said, I read your book by George Dembski, Inside Spaceships. I said, you bought that book. I said, do you believe that he was telling the truth? They told me he was crazy. And she says, well, didn't you? You just saw it out there. So now what do you do? Well, I'm convinced that what I saw was, to my knowledge, we wouldn't have had anything that size. And. Uh, and uh, I'm certain uh, that it was from another planet, on the field, uh, not from this planet. I mean, just nothing, our technology was not such at that time that we could have any kind of a craft like that. I'm sure of that.